Greetings to all our today's guest, Yuri Rashkin, communications instructor at University of Wisconsin at Whitewater, a local elected official in Rock uh, County, Wisconsin, and an independent journalist, host of YouTube channel Rashkin Report. Yuri, glad to see you and thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, Ole. And Slava Ukraini. Heroim Slava. Yuri, uh, Russia's attack on Ukraine on Monday, August 26, was one of the largest yet. Russia fired more than 100 missiles of various types and about 100 Shahed drones, according to President Volodymyr Zelensky. And Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Rustem Omerov, on Facebook said, Ukraine is preparing a response to today's massive Russian shelling, which killed and injured civilians. Your own reaction on this terrorist attack by Russia, is this another proof of Ukrainians' need to have long-range capabilities and to lift restrictions on strikes on Russian military targets? The way I see this is this is all, this is a sign, signs of Putin's panic. Uh, the fact that he finds himself in this very unenviable, untenable position where he has military action is happening on his territory and he has to somehow uh, pretend like everything is great. And this is exactly what he had in mind all along. You know, that, that looks strange. So I, it makes sense that he would try to do something to try to change the narrative. But it's only a matter of time at this point before Russia collapses. If you look at the success that Ukraine is having militarily um, and the weakness that Russia is demonstrating all over the place. Um, of course, my hope this is all going to bring us to negotiation table where Ukraine is going to be in the stronger position and the very strongest position possible. And if uh, Russian negotiations are really a capitulation, but they're old negotiations, that's okay, because I, I think that uh, that is a compromise I feel that everyone can accept. But Russia needs to understand that it is uh, the position that is only going to get weaker. They can have a success today, they can have maybe success tomorrow, but they are losing uh, because they're not able to control the situation. They lost control over the, the situation on the battlefield. And so um, that's kind of part one. Part two is I just came back from a, a visit to Ukraine and I, I was in Kiev and in Lviv. And the, the difference in the mindset of people who live in Kiev who used to be um, really feeling very exposed and vulnerable to Russian attacks, but now because of American air defense systems manned by Ukrainian soldiers, um, people in Ukraine, in Kiev, actually feel relatively safe. And it is really a huge change because this is what a country needs to be able to, country needs to be able to function even at war. And uh, what uh, American air defense and uh, American policy has done and by protecting Kiev really creates a lot of um, opportunities uh, for country, but also for people who live there. Uh, because having been born in Soviet Union, I have this memory you know, of reading and hearing a lot about Stalin's purges and Stalin's terror of 1930s and how people um, you know, would vanish during the night because the Stalin's secret police would show up and people would be arrested, usually at night. Um, and, and looking at what was happening in Kiev in particular, where life during the day is almost like normal. Um, but then at night, when people part, when people say goodbye to each other at night, they say, um, have, have a calm and quiet night. And it doesn't mean like, hey, have a good night. It means like terrible things could happen during the night and I hope to see you next time. I hope you make it through. And, and I thought if that's how people were uh, communicating with each other in part during Stalin's purges, when they were, um, they, they could not say anything to anybody. They were all in their own individual cocoons kind of. And, uh, um, but then they, they knew that at night terrible things happened. How we know this, because there's stories of people who were, would have a, a suitcase packed by their uh, door out of their apartment in Soviet Union, because if at night uh, police came, all you could grab was that suitcase and head out. So people knew, people were prepared, people were expecting. And it feels very similar to what is going on um, in, in Kiev right now. And I think with that in mind, seeing how, you know, it, it's the 
people here discuss that maybe uh, trauma and PTSD or PTSR, I guess it is called in Ukraine, um, 25, maybe 35 percent of people. Who knows the exact numbers? But to me, um, I think 100 percent of people have suffered and, and are being traumatized because if you think that there could be a rocket flying into your house because you know that Russia doesn't fight the army so much as it fights just people and tries to terrorize the population of Ukraine, um, it's it's hard for economy because if you're going to run to the bomb shelter every time that there is a you know a threat on your phone and my phone in Kiev was beeping pretty regularly, especially at night with notifications of air alarms and uh, um, uh, that's that's no way to run a country. That's no way to run an economy. People get exhausted. People want to sleep. Then people don't go to shelters, and and that leads to more devastation and all of that. So the fact that the sky over Kiev is now essentially closed is a huge, huge thing. And the fact that Putin can send lots and lots of drones and then they get all shut down, that's all part of the story. But why is he able to be even this successful? Because he is located very close to Ukraine. He's like next door. He's the country on the other side of the border. And so for him, uh, the distance that his weapons have to cover is not very large. And so now that the United States is finally saying that we are supporting, approving, and have no problem uh, with the fact that Ukraine has to, uh, you know, uh, take care of its uh, of its uh, territory and to protect its territory by um, destroying arms systems that are shooting at Ukraine from Russia from just across the border. Well, that seems pretty logical and natural. And now because of American policy and Ukrainian uh, military success, um, the Russian troops have had to pull back. And the, the system, the, the, the systems that are used to attack Ukrainian cities had to pull back. And that creates a lot of um, capability. It creates capabilities. It creates opportunities. This is what a country needs to breathe in order to be able to catch its breath and to go on a counteroffensive, which we're seeing with Kursk. So the way I see it, both kind of from the outside and a little bit on the inside, the United States absolutely has to give Ukraine permission to use whatever weapons it wants wherever in Russian territory it needs to, to, to stop the war, to win the war, to defeat Russia. Um, and it, it makes sense, I think, militarily, politically, economically, on, on every possible level. Um, and uh, I feel like in the United States, we sometimes have a difficult time understanding how people live in other countries and what that means, because Ukraine is not just a battlefield, that is also cities where people live. And and to convey all of that and, and how uh, Russia fights a terrorist war by really attacking civilians at night while they're sleeping and people are afraid of terrorists, they're not afraid so much of Russian troops marching in. They're afraid of um, Russian rockets uh, showing up uh, in the middle of the night. So I think for all of those reasons, it, it behooves us for um, you know, to, to if we're that interested in Ukraine succeeding, then we really ought to give Ukraine the tools that it needs to do the work that we want it to do. So really, this is just a uh, this is what we want. This is what Ukraine wants. This is what Putin doesn't want. So it's perfect. Yuri, we will talk about um, Putin's red lines and Kursk region, but I need to say that the Ukrainian air defense forces could do much more to protect. Uh, civilian lives if the aviation of European neighbors operated together with Ukrainian, for example, F-16s, air defense systems. And we remember that on August 26, Poland deployed aircraft to its southeast due to the threat of Russian missiles attacks on Western Ukraine. Um, and um, uh, it's uh, like uh, in Western Ukraine, the Polish uh, Army's operational command said, APA reports, and we remember that NATO Secretary General um, Jens Stoltenberg has made it clear that he is opposed uh, to um, Poland using its air defense system to shoot down Russian missiles over the territory of Ukraine. Will NATO's, how do you think, policy change? Look, from what I saw, just on the ground level, traveling from Ukraine to Poland, um, people really, really appreciate the safety of being in a NATO country. When when you shift from being a country at war and then all of a sudden you're in a place where nothing's going to happen. 
I mean, in part because Joe Biden said that we're going to defend every inch of territory of NATO, but whatever, it's not happening. This is a safe place. And, and I think that works um, both ways, because on one hand, of course, NATO has incredible um, uh, capabilities and abilities to destroy Russian army. Uh, but at the same time, that would end the peace uh, the, that the NATO countries are currently enjoying. And they're doing everything, it seems to me, in their power to avoid losing peace. They want to be at peace. And if that means uh, sustaining Ukraine's war effort, then that's what they're willing to do. And that's, you know, I think as far as I'm concerned, that's fine. Because, you know, Ukraine is not part of NATO. Ukraine is not part of the United States. Ukraine is not our 51st state. So there has to be some, you know, responsibilities and understanding both uh, both ways. Um, but at the same time, it's hard to, you know, and we see how weak Putin is because of what uh, Ukrainian army is able to do. Um, but uh, long term, the solution has to be in Ukraine becoming part of NATO, because we see that's the only thing Putin seems to be afraid of, is when Ukraine countries that are in NATO, you know, because we talk so much about uh, Baltic countries and what danger they're in. Perhaps, probably, maybe, but right now it seems like they're perfectly fine because they're in NATO. And I think that Ukraine more and more wants to be in NATO. Of course, there's challenges because being in NATO, as far as I understand it, means that Ukraine would have to seize active military uh, campaign trying to restore its territory and work more like West Germany did when it tried to, for decades, to reconnect uh, you know, re reinstate itself as a one state with Eastern Germany, but at the same time, West Germany was part of NATO. Um, and maybe that's the uh, a solution. Um, in fact, it seems like the most likely solution to work to end the war in this uh, in this environment we're in is where parts of Ukraine that are uh, controlled by uh, that, that are uh, that are controlled by Kiev, uh, the, the, the country of Ukraine joins NATO. Uh, and NATO gives Ukraine the, the guarantee, like it did to Sweden or to Finland, uh, that during the time that Ukraine is you know, doing all the legal stuff that needs to get done, um, there's already a protection from NATO. Uh, because there's re every reason to believe that this would lead to end of the war, because uh, Putin is afraid of NATO. The problem is, is that there's territories that Putin currently controls, such as Donbass, such as Crimea, and getting those territories back, this is not a question of whether they're going to be legally Putin's, they'll never be legally Putin's. But the, the question of getting them back is something that, you know, I really wanted to see how serious the Ukrainians take uh, and consider. But to them, every inch of their territory is every inch of their territory. And if I say, well, do you really need Crimea? They'll say, well, do you really need Alaska? You know, maybe you can, you know, you could give up Alaska if it meant peace with Russia. Would you do that? And I'm like, I don't think so. I don't think we're going to give up Alaska, you know. So it's it's a matter of putting yourself in, in shoes of the other person um, that I think helps to gain some perspective. Um, at this point, I think that I also historically realize that countries get admitted to NATO, as I say, during sunny weather, when there is no opportunity of any war breaking out, because it's a because NATO is not a military, it's it's a it's, it's not an offensive alliance, it's a defensive alliance. It's alliance that even now is fulfilling its mission of defending its member states. Um, so it's not going, so it's, it's unreasonable. It's unreasonable in my understanding to expect NATO to go on offensive. That's just not what it does. I think that even when the only time the Article 5 was used after attacks on the United States uh, after 9-11, um, I mean, we saw that uh, uh, NATO in action, NATO troops in action, um, but it seems like this is not going to be that type of a scenario here because we don't have a, a small group attack, a huge superpower. You know, this is just very different. And, and it's hard to imagine how NATO would get it actively involved in war with Russia unless Russia was actively uh, fighting with NATO or presenting real threat to NATO countries which at this point, it doesn't seem to. Right now, Russia is kind of collapsing on its own. And uh, the, the, I think uh, this is very interesting to me because um, one of the things I noticed is that English-speaking people are absolutely allowing for the possibility that Putin will use a nuclear weapon. Uh, Russian-speaking people, and I think perhaps Ukrainian-speaking people, 
don't believe that he will use nuclear weapon on Ukraine. But they consider it a possibility that he might use nuclear weapon on Russia, which I don't think bothers Ukrainians as much, maybe even as Americans. Um, so all of those things having taken into consideration, we have to accept the fact that we can sit and talk about this and try to share perspective. And so people have a better information, better understanding, uh, more, you know, more complete understanding of the situation. But we also have to understand that ultimate responsibility rests on the person who has access to that button. And that means that the responsibility rests with Putin and it means the responsibility rests with President of the United States. Um, right now, Joe Biden, perhaps in a few months, Kamala Harris. But I think that we have to, it's, it's easy for me to say, let's nuke Moscow, because you know what, I don't live there. Um, but really, let's let's be honest, that is, uh, might not work out as long as we're on the same planet as Russia. And the fact that we still are on the same planet as Russia means we have to take that into consideration. And that just means that we have to keep working on getting Ukraine all the weapon systems and all the help that Ukraine needs, because it is doing with our help what we want to be done. We want to weaken Russia. We want to make sure, sure that Russia doesn't present a threat and danger uh, that it has. And in, in, in the attack on Ukraine is a just further proof how dangerous Russia is. So I'm not saying that, like, you know, how Putin would say, denazify, demilitarize. But to a certain extent, that's exactly what Russia needs. Russia has become radicalized, a country that needs to be de-radicalized, however you call that radicalism. It is a country that absolutely lost control of what to do with its military and sense of purpose because it just wants more territory and genocide, which means Russia shouldn't have military. Uh, you know, So all of those things that Putin wanted to do to Ukraine, to some extent, are desperately needed to be done in Russia, but they need to be done um, either by Ukrainian troops or even better by Russian people, who unfortunately prefer sitting and waiting for somebody to come and rescue them. But we'll see as the situation continues to disintegrate if at some point they might uh, either there might be uh, an uprising or coup, simply because the situation from the outside is clearly unsustainable. But from the inside, it's another day in Russia. Yuri, you told about nuclear nuclear weapon, nuclear war, and when the international community refers to the crossing of uh, red lines, it tends to be limited to the um, use of nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons and the supply of other lethal weapons. But uh, Ukraine's incursion through Russia's defenses during the first mayor foreign invasion since World War II has exposed uh, the Kremlin seemingly imaginary red lines and revealed the passive and muted response from Russian ruler Vladimir Putin. Um, I um, said it by the Washington Post. Uh, we understand that um, U.S. policy on military assistance to Ukraine should have been a shining example, but it reminded timid. But if we're talking about red, uh, red lines, Ukraine has repeatedly crossed uh, Moscow's imaginary red lines. Um, for example, you remember that in particular, the sinking of the Russian flagship Moskva, uh, the explosion on the Crimean bridge in 2022, uh, drone attacks on the Kremlin and Moscow in 2023, and attacks on Russian strategic air bases. In addition, the Western equipment used by Ukrainian forces was also once a red line, isn't it? Look, um, or the, the way I look at it is that there are red lines, but they're not the red lines that uh, we think there may be. Because to me, it seems like red lines are hold on power, Putin's hold on power. If Putin feels he is losing hold on power, then he would look at all options. But currently, I think from his point of view, even what is going on in Kursk does not seem like uh, it is a threat to his regime. After all, his country is rather huge. And if he is, and he lives in a make-believe land of his uh, reports that are given to him by his FSB security personnel, and he supposedly is not on internet, and he supposedly either consumes his own propaganda, because I was told that when he travels, he has TVs with him, so he could watch Soviet propaganda. I mean, that's no different than certain former president who likes to watch Fox News. Um, so that's, that's kind of a misleading yourself. Um, but in the meantime, TV keeps telling Putin that everything's fine. So I think he feels fine. So on some level, maybe it's important that the last, you know, whatever is happening, whatever 
Abrams tanks or, you know, by Ukrainian troops are on Red Square. Putin is still in his bunker watching Russian TV saying that everything is great. Everything is fine. Because maybe that's a way to prevent him from pressing that button, which may or may not work and may lead to what he wants or may lead to some other, you know, horrific consequence, which may be what he wants. So basically, I think right now, red lines, there are red lines because everybody has some kind of a mental red line. But as we often find out with ourselves, even our own red lines are not necessarily what we think they might be because it turns out that, oh, maybe that wasn't quite so bad. And Russia is not quite a family business, but more like a family mafia. Um, and so they have a different understanding of what a threat is because they're not concerned about attacks on population. Population is nothing. They're cannon fodder. So how is attack on Russian population threatens Putin? It doesn't. So I think that there's just a different system of um, parameters and measuring uh, things <laughs> that how we're looking at the situation that makes us misunderstand where the red lines are, what red lines are, how they function. Um, and, and I think that because Putin feels that there's red lines that are th when the situation is threatening to him, but he will never accept the situation is threatening to him, that effectively means that perhaps there are no red lines, effectively. But again, the responsibility on using, finding out if there are red lines does not lie with me, and it doesn't even lie with you. And it lies with uh, the president of the United States. Um, so I think this is where the level of responsibility determines the level of uh, response. Because it is easy for me to say Russia needs to give up all its territory that it took away from Ukraine and, and quickly surrender and restore and return people that it kidnapped and pay compensation to Ukraine that it, uh, that it uh, warrants uh, for destruction. Um, but I am not president of the United States. And I think president has a very different level of responsibility. I just know that it's important to understand that even though Ukraine cannot participate in our elections, our two parties are not equal. And while Ukrainians tend to think that no matter who president of the United States is, that person will feel bound to defend and help Ukraine against Russian aggression, I really don't feel that's the case. Um, and, and I think that that's just one of those things that I feel is, is a problem uh, when I speak to Ukrainians and I, and I talk to Ukrainian people and audiences is that there's a feeling of kind of equivalency. And we live right now in the United States, the country as, as it is today, where two parties have a very, very different view on what we want to do with our allies, what we want to do um, with uh, different other countries. And, you know, I, I got I to share the story because I just it, it really made me think when I was in Lviv, Lviv is just amazing uh, city for restaurants and bars, not because there's like, I don't know, loud music and drinking. There's, there's lots of drinking. But the point is that they're all themed. They're theme restaurants, they're, whether it's a pharmacy or I don't know, whatever. Uh, there's a mine for coffee. There's a coffee mine restaurant because apparently there's so much coffee in Lviv. They have such a strong coffee culture that must be mined somewhere in Lviv. It's because Ukraine has a big mine, uh, coal mine culture. So I think they, they like melded coffee and mine and coal together. Um, but one place that I really like is called Kriyevka. And, and that is a kind of like a reenactment of the underground Ukrainian, um, um, how, how a Ukrainian underground was fighting against Poles, against Germans, against Soviets, everybody to, to you know, create Ukraine to, uh, for the state of Ukraine, which sometimes existed and most of the time didn't exist. And so this was an underground restaurant with underground attractions with a secret entry because that's what Ukrainians had to do uh, to survive, to be able to be patriots of their own country. Um, and now with allies, because then there was no single country that would recognize Ukrainian opposition as, a, as a, a, it would provide them weapons, nothing. They, they basically were able to get a few things here and there, sometimes from Germans, from Poles and Russians. So uh, now Ukraine's situation is drastically different. And I feel that even though we need to be doing a lot more help to Ukraine than we have, and uh, because it is in our best interest, it's in Ukraine's best interest, it really just makes sense. But the comparison of what happens when a country is fighting against invaders all by and occupants all by itself versus when it has a, a democratic state itself, when it has a democratically elected leader, when it has allies, that is such a huge difference. And, and I'm really just 
you know, glad that we are in 2024 and not in like 1924. Uh, there really is a big difference between what Ukraine is going through right now and success that it is enjoying when it has some of the tools that it needs versus um, 100 years ago when it was being really just upheld by um, people's emotion and and uh, their patriotism. It's a lot, but it's not enough. You really, really for patriots, if, you know, it helps to have weapons and allies. And, and I'm really glad, I was really glad to visit Ukraine as representative of an ally. You know, I'm not just an American tourist or whatever, a journalist. Uh, I'm I'm here representing American support for Ukraine. That was so cool. I really appreciated, and I think people really appreciated me. We had a great time, and and I think that's a that's a beginning of a, you know that's how our road forward and is built. You were, we were glad um, that you came uh, to Ukraine, and if we're talking about Lviv, uh, you told about coffee. Um, you know that Lviv is a city of aristocratic tranquility, and if we're talking about the taste of coffee, this flavor is unmistakable. Bitter, spicy, aromatic. Uh, it's not just a drink, it represents the history of an ancient city, and it's true. Uh, and also, if we're talking about, um, if we're talking about, uh, for example, um, um, President um, of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, in a statement uh, to Indian media about the Ukrainian oppression in Kursk region, uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky has pointed out that there was no uh, powerful Russian air defense in Kursk region, in contrast to the area surrounding Russian ruler Vladimir Putin's various houses. How do you think uh, this fact that Russian air defense protects Putin's duchess, but not Kursk region, gives Russian citizens understanding that they are, for Putin, nothing? They are nothing. They are cannon fodder. The problem is they understand it very well and they behave like cannon fodder. That's really terrible. Um, I think that I, even when they're not in the army, because I hear horror stories about Russian tourists from Ukrainians. Uh, so this is a, it's a, an interesting situation, but something that I, I wanted to point out because if we're going to talk about coffee, I feel like uh, and Lviv is on Western Ukraine, so it's much more peaceful. There was one uh, air alert while I was there over several days versus like several every night uh, in Kiev, and I was surprised because I felt like Ukrainians are almost a little like uneasy about talking about the fact that life goes on, like people are drinking coffee and. And things are happening in, in Ukraine, but that's fine. That's this is so crucial. I think that there is a battlefield, and we all we hear in the United States about Ukraine is the battlefield and the red lines and the next weapon and the next weapon. But there's life going on. There's people living their lives. It's a European country. It's not some uh, place where we have no way to connect to. We just go this go. This is really weird. No, it's really normal. It's really familiar. It's coffee culture, you know, for crying out loud. So I think that on one hand, maybe it is difficult for Ukrainians to talk about how life goes on while they're asking for us for military help. But maybe this is where I can say, you know what, this is, uh, Ukraine is a great place and, and it needs victory so that, because uh, I know it has a bright, bright future because I went there and I saw it. Um, and I think that this is just really remarkable. And as far as Putin is concerned, yes, to come back to where we started, this is a sign of weakness because Ukraine is splicing and dicing uh, Russia, but because Putin in his uh, crazy mind uh, uh, thinks that it's more important to defend his duchess, to defend his person, because he is Russia. If there's no Putin, there is no Russia. Um, this this is what the war is about. The people will say sometimes, uh, you know, is Ukraine really a democracy? Is Russia really a dictatorship? Look at what's going on. Look at where the priorities are. Look at who is fighting who. If Ukraine was not a democracy, Putin would not be fighting it. Look, he made really good deal. You know, he gets along pretty well, just fine with Belarus. So that's how we know that Belarus is not a democracy. Um, and uh, the fact that he's defending his duchess, his people are never going to, they, they believe that they're supposed to have a strong boss. That strong boss is some, because they're slaves, basically. It's a slave mentality. It's terrible. But they feel like as long as the boss is strong, that they are viewed with fear in the world, it works for them. It is so traumatizing. I mean, I, I said that everybody who leaves Russia should have a psychologist, therapist, you know, attached to them to just kind of help them through the trauma. But when a country enters a bloody war that it started, uh, it does something terrible with people's psyche. And, uh, and at that point, I think that uh, these people, 
they have no sense of ownership in the country. This is what it's hard for us to understand. We we hear all these stories about Russia, fatherland, motherland, whatever land, but these people are effectively being conquered by their own state. They're occupied. Russians are in a way occupied like any other country that Russia conquers because they're also occupied and they're controlled by their own state. And they don't have any sense of belong. Like this is, I have to fight for this. I mean, you know, this is where when they find out that Ukraine is controlling or Ukraine is going to train troops are coming, they start looting their own stores because there is no sense of ownership. There's no sense of defending their land. It's just propaganda, which also means that those red lines are really kind of mushy and uh, um, and are far less uh, real than I think military planners feel based on the this kind of assumption. And I noticed this where uh, Ukrainians think that America is just like Ukraine, but a little different. And Americans think that Ukraine is kind of like America, but a little different. No, Ukraine and America are different because we had different paths historically. And we are here, you know, we didn't fall out of a coconut tree. We're here because of all the things that have happened before us. And we have the present that is formed by the past. Um, and, and therefore, I think that uh, I'm just thinking that Russia is going to respond how military in, in the West thinks it will, uh, may not be taking the full picture in quite well now. The Guardian sitting its sources says um, Russia will only consider negotiations if it believes that Ukraine is able to threaten Moscow and St. Petersburg. The newspaper reports that Ukraine is seeking Western authorization to, year, to use UK French long range storm shadow missiles to strike deep inside Russia. Uh, could this, how do you think, could this pressure Moscow into negotiation, um, ce cessation? Of hostilities, and I need to say again that we categorically do not agree to the condition uh, to the conditions of the terrorist country Russia. If you listen to my good friend writer Yuri Fushtinsky, who is probably world's like most authority on history of KGB and FSB, um, he feels that it is absolutely crucial, exactly like you said, to attack Moscow and Saint Petersburg because Putin will not get the message otherwise. Um, to what extent uh, Western countries uh, are willing to support, it's, it's going to be a bad picture. Let's just be honest about it. Attack on Moscow is not going to look like a attack on Kursk. It's going to be a lot of buildings destroyed. It's going to be people hurt. And even though Ukrainians have no love lost with Russia, for the rest of the world, there's still going to be a possibility of another humanitarian crisis. And, uh, you know, we, we already, like in the early 90s, we, we sent... Um, you, the Russians still remember, Ukrainians do as well. When Russia fell, uh, Soviet Union collapsed, America sent uh, drumsticks, uh, chicken drumsticks uh, to Russia that were called uh, uh, Bush's legs. And, and so these Bush's legs were, were sent uh, to humanitarian crisis. And um, if uh, Moscow is attacked, there will be, you know, a uh, humanitarian crisis and during which, uh, you know, the legs are probably not, maybe Biden, maybe Harris. Um, will be given out uh, from uh, Abrams tank on the Red Square. Um, it's a beautiful picture, but uh, for people who really understand the damage that Russia has done to this world, but it is a terrible picture for those who see human suffering as one. Um, and therefore, um, um, the fact that Ukraine is already able to do as much is in a way reflection of the horror that Russia has caused in Ukraine. Because attacks on Russia are responsibility of Putin. Everything that is happening right now, even when people say, you know, America is not helping enough. Yes, America is not helping enough, but it's responsibility of Vladimir Putin because he started this war with his regime and he needs to stop the war or be removed from power. But he, he, carries, the, he carries the burden of responsibility for, for everything that is happening because without him, there would be no war. Um, and um, whether, you know, I'm a Moscovite. I was born and raised in old city Moscow, and I would feel terrible if a tomahawk hit Patriarch Pond, where I spent my childhood. It's a beautiful old park. But you know what? I wasn't on the way to Ukraine. I went to a couple of cities, and I was in Warsaw. Warsaw, really old Warsaw, doesn't exist. It's a, it's a city that's been built, really, not really I don't know. It's a lot of white apartment block buildings, kind of boring, but I guess that was, you know, Soviet influence. Um, it's a new city. 
And and, uh, and Lviv, on the other hand, is an old city, which is part of the, what makes it so remarkable, because Lviv was not destroyed during World War II, like most European cities. Um, and it makes it a beautiful tourist attraction. It's amazing, um, you know, a monument of architecture and history. And uh, Russia, you know, they don't really, I, I don't know what's there to preserve. Um, there are buildings that were hastily constructed to make it look like there's a business center in Moscow. When you come close, up close to those buildings, you see that they're unfinished, that the bottom floors are looking shoddy. Um, because it's a picture. It's a, it's a country built for a picture. There is really no authentic culture because everything was under uh, censorship for hundreds of years. Um, and, and it's a very uh, fake country that has that lacks foundation on which it's going to even rebuild itself. It is such a dreadful situation where people are been brainwashed into feeling that they have a great language, great culture, great history, great government, great land, and they have none of it. Um, it's going to be difficult for Russia, but we have to think about protecting the rest of the world first, starting with Ukraine. Yuri, thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for um, interesting conversation and supporting our country, supporting Ukraine. Guys, uh, subscribe on our YouTube channel, subscribe on Yuri's YouTube channel, like this video, and see you. I just say that you're a Russian communications instructor at the University of Wisconsin at Wide Water, a local elected official in Rocky County, Wisconsin, and an independent journalist, host of YouTube channel Russian Report, What Without. Thank you so much and see you.